When it comes to trying to describe the universe, physicists generally love their logarithmic graphs. And it's basically a kind of a tradition in physics to essentially try to describe everything in the entire universe by using various types of logarithmic graphs, where instead of a linear progression, you essentially get a progression where everything increases by basically 10 times. So for example, in this case, you're looking at the logarithmic graph involving distances away from planet Earth. And as the graph progresses, things escalate pretty quickly. As you can see right here, within just seconds, we're now looking at various nearby stars, we're then looking at faraway stars, and we're now outside of the Milky Way galaxy. Although admittedly, one of the most impressive logarithmic graphs ever made is the one by the artist Pablo Carlo Budassi, whose website and whose links you can find in the description. He's been actually creating these for a very long time, and they usually look absolutely gorgeous. But what exactly is the point of all of this, especially when it comes to science and physics? Well, obviously, visualization. It helps us to imagine enormous things, enormous concepts, in something that our puny brains can actually understand. Like for example right here, we're literally looking at the entire observable universe. Something that would be almost impossible for us to imagine otherwise. And so basically, log graphs are cool, and log graphs that allow us to see things even better are even cooler. And well, today we're actually going to be talking about a recent study that created the ultimate log graph. The log graph of, I guess, everything. The entire universe. But unlike this one, in this case, it is not an artistic log graph. It's actually a scientific, physical log graph that to some extent even starts to answer certain questions about the entire universe. Like, for example, is there any chance we possibly live in a black hole? Or how exactly did the universe start and what did it possibly come from? And turns out that by plotting these log graphs, it might actually become possible to start answering some of these questions. And so, yeah. Hello, wonderful person. This is Anton. And today we're basically just going to discuss this based on a recent study you can find in the description, simply referred to as all objects and some questions. And even though by itself this particular study does not actually do anything extraordinary and doesn't produce anything that we didn't know before, it does manage to integrate a lot of things into one single picture, potentially allowing us to answer some questions. Maybe even questions about how the universe started, because that's essentially what the initial question for the scientist was, trying to understand where exactly all of the objects in the entire universe came from. And based on modern studies, we believe the universe began approximately 13.8 billion years ago, when there were practically no physical objects anywhere. Yet that's not the case today, with physical objects like stars, planets, galaxies and so on essentially being all over the place, with the main explanation so far essentially being the cooling down of the universe and the condensation of various hot plasma into physical objects that then formed everything else. And so basically here, everything sort of started with condensation. Various more complex objects started to form when the binding energy of these objects exceeded the background energy which is represented in one of the graphs in the paper that basically shows us how, over time, the physical matter in the universe transitioned into what it is today. And so to try to make sense of this, the researchers behind the study decided to basically focus on the extremes. They focused on the size of the objects, the total mass of the objects, and then on the physical limitations of both of these properties. So for example, when it comes to size, the biggest obvious size right now is the entire observable universe. That's sort of what you see right here. And we usually measure this with what's known as the Hubble radius, roughly equivalent to about 14 billion parsecs. And so beyond that, we actually have no idea what's going on. But we can only assume that things are maybe very similar to what we have in the observable universe. But on the opposite side we have the smallest size. And here they define this with what's known as the Compton limit. In this case, this is a limit connected to what's known as Compton scattering, a concept that would be very difficult to explain in a single video, but essentially it relates to the idea of quantum physics, where when things get really, really small, the relativistic quantum effects become significant enough to suddenly transform various waves into various particles, and also connects to the idea of inability of measuring the position of a particle Mostly because at this point, when the particles become really small, the photons acquire so much energy that they essentially start producing new particle-antiparticles of a similar type. 
In other words, or I guess in simpler terms, it just means that when things get really, really small, it practically becomes impossible to measure them, and they essentially reach their Compton limit. And so here on this graph, the Compton wavelength represents the minimum radius of a particle. And right at the limit, right at this line, we have things like quarks, electrons, neutrinos, and the photons of various types of light. So they basically represent the smallest possible objects in the entire universe, depending on their mass. But if you look closer, you'll see that a lot of other things, like for example atoms, or even bacteria and viruses, lie somewhere above this limit. But what's the other limit? Well, it's of course the maximum possible mass to size ratio. Because basically, at certain point, according to relativistic theories, when something becomes too dense, it's supposed to become a black hole. And so here on top we have things forbidden by gravity. Right on the line you have different types of black holes, right above the line, technically, nothing should be possible. And so here, on the left side, we have the smallest possible observable black hole, whereas on the right side we have, well, basically the entire universe. This is where the Hubble radius lies as well. And this is of course really intriguing, because it kind of implies that, okay, maybe just maybe, the observable universe is a massive black hole. Which is basically one of the questions this particular study tries to tackle. Is the universe a black hole? We'll come back to this answer in a few minutes. And everything below this, as you can see, are various types of physical objects in the universe. The Milky Way is there, various clusters, various types of galaxies, and of course more common objects, such as our own planet, the Sun, and even things like neutron stars and white dwarfs. In case you're wondering, you are right here. And some of the largest objects in here, so things like superclusters and voids, in terms of the total density, are surprisingly not actually that much denser than the empty universe. In this case, for example, superclusters are only about 20% more dense than the current matter density of the universe itself. And so even though we imagine various types of superclusters as these really huge massive objects, in terms of the actual total density, they're just a little bit more dense than pure empty space with the various galactic voids, which usually contain even less matter, being just a little bit less dense in total. And so essentially everything on this graph is either limited by the maximum possible density, which makes them a black hole, or the quantum limitations, where various small particles have to now be represented by what's known as the de Broglie wavelength, representing a fundamental limit on measuring the position of a certain particle. Which is actually pretty awesome, because in this case, it combines the quantum effects, or quantum limitations, with relativistic limitations proposed by Einstein. In some sense, potentially connecting both ideas. And while well, interestingly, all types of black holes, from the smallest to the largest, essentially lie on this diagonal line. But if you keep going down the line, you'll then reach a kind of an intersection between the quantum limits and the gravitational limits. And right here we have something scientists refer to as the instanton. Instanton? Instant Anton. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so whatever this is, this is the place where quantum mechanics intersects with general relativity, meaning at the smallest possible object in the entire universe. And what this plot essentially suggests is that maybe, just maybe, this is exactly what the universe came from. It came from instant Anton. I mean instanton. Uh, Instanton, a tiny, tiny, tiny thing with very specific size and mass that might have began everything. And not a singularity or some kind of a vague, unexplainable concept that a lot of ideas proposed before. And so here, instead of having some kind of a hypothetical point of infinite density and infinite temperature, we actually have something with very specific size, specific mass, specific density that potentially started everything. Which by itself is a really, really big proposition, and is definitely something that needs to be investigated. Although intriguingly, if you look at the graph, you'll notice that because this is a log graph, for quite a while in both gravity and quantum effects, there's basically nothing for quite a while until you reach some of the smallest things, such as for example quarks, or the smallest observable black hole. Which basically implies that this instanton would be ridiculously small way, way smaller than anything measurable, smaller than anything imaginable, and beyond anything involving subatomic particles. So that's of course one intriguing proposition behind the study. It proposes instantons 
as the smallest objects in the entire universe and potentially the objects everything came from. In some sense, I guess you can imagine them as Planck mass black holes that would possibly only exist for a Planck second before basically either being annihilated or forming the entire universe. And so these unusual tiny particles seem to be essential ingredients for quantum cosmology and are probably very important to help solve a lot of mysteries of the entire universe. But as the scientists in this paper mentioned, it is beyond the scope of this particular paper. Here they just made a graph. But the other intriguing part of the paper is the fact that the entire universe, the Hubble radius, also lies on the black hole line. And so is there any chance we live inside a black hole? A very large black hole, but a black hole nonetheless. In this case, in terms of actual density, if the universe was the black hole, surprisingly, it would have exactly the same density as what we actually observe around us. And that's actually because the larger the black hole, the lower the density gets. At some point, some black holes reach such a low density that you can technically go inside of them and you will basically feel nothing. But that's beside the point. The point is that, is the universe one? And we're here to explain this, the scientists behind this paper make another simple assumption. The assumption in regards to what happens outside of the observable universe. And here there are basically only two options. The universe outside of the Hubble radius can either have same density as what we have right here, but we just can't see anything because of the speed of light limit, or alternatively, maybe the density suddenly drops, with everything outside of the universe basically having zero density. Which by itself would be somewhat difficult to explain with modern physics, because such a drop in density just would not make sense. And so the more likely explanation here is that the density outside of the observable universe is the same as the density inside. And if both densities are the same, it's physically impossible for us to be inside a black hole because it basically breaks a lot of mathematics behind what's known as the Schwarzschild radius. And so the only way this could be a black hole is basically if we can somehow explain how the density outside of the observable universe suddenly becomes zero. At the moment, there's no physical way to explain any of this. And so long story short, according to this physical explanation, we most likely do not live in a supermassive black hole. And so yeah, until someone can find other physics that explains otherwise, we're going to assume that we're not in a black hole. But naturally here we also have quite a few questions, specifically questions with so-called forbidden parts of the plot. For example, here we have various parts forbidden by gravity, and so what exactly lies beyond this is obviously a big mystery. And here we have things forbidden by quantum physics, also a big mystery as well. But the biggest mystery of them all is of course the cross-section with basically this black triangle representing some kind of a double forbidden region, something that scientists believe, if we actually study mathematically, could help us finally find solutions to things like, for example, quantum gravity, and thus one day help us finally understand the very nature of the entire universe and help us solve every possible physical mystery. But at the moment though, it's just something that's forbidden by mathematics and even forbidden by physical laws of the universe. In this particular case, this is even double forbidden. Nevertheless, this particular examination is still really intriguing. It actually helps us visualize things that we would not be able to visualize otherwise, and of course raises a lot of very interesting questions. Questions that maybe some of the future studies might be able to answer. But I guess for now, it's still somewhat cool that someone was actually able to put everything physical in the entire universe on a single logarithmic graph. The ultimate achievement for all physicists out there. But anyway, on that note, once there are some additional discoveries, we'll come back and talk more about this in some of the future videos. Subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership, or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.